started. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today for our first session in a two-part series on equity with our Fellows Committee and the Emerging Architects Committee. Um, I hope everyone out there is doing well and staying safe. Like I said, we'll get started shortly. I just have a couple of quick housekeeping issues to go over first. Uh, first off, by participating in this webinar, you are granting your permission to be recorded and for the recording to be distributed as AIADC and the Washington Architectural Foundation may choose. Second, we will have time for Q&A after the panel portion of this, so please type any questions you have into the Q&A box, and I'll help relay those to our moderators after the, the, their discussion concludes. Um, and last, as a follow-up conversation to this panel, we'll be meeting again on September 16th at the same time, and we'll hope you join us then. So thank you again for coming, and I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Joel Zingazer. Thank you, Katie, <clears throat> and thank you, Marco Marinucci of MVA Architects, also for all of your work on helping to make this program possible. Welcome to this webinar titled, A Conversation with Fellows, <clears throat> Emerging Architects and Equity. I'm Joel Zingaser, a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a member of the AIA DC Fellows Public Programs Committee. The Fellows Public Programs Committee uh, was formed to engage and promote the talents and broad experience of the DC chapters fellows through a series of programs that provide a heightened level of participation by the fellows. Simply put, the FPPC is a vehicle for the DC fellows to both give back and pay forward to the profession of architecture, to young architects, and to the community at large. Today is session one of a two-part program. Today's session is to encourage a dialogue about diversity and equality within our profession, to better understand and engage with a community of color, and to listen to, support, and participate in an exchange of ideas with the Institute's Emerging Architects Committee. The fellows appreciate that listening to and being involved with uh, and working with and learning from young architects is a key part of supporting, mentoring, and working with them in today's profession. Session two <clears throat> will be held, as Katie said, in two weeks on Wednesday, September 16th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. A separate registration notice has been issued uh, so that all of you and others who you may encourage uh, will have a chance to sign up and get involved. So let's get started. 2020 is proving to be an unprecedented year. While the world is challenged by a global pandemic, a movement has begun in the US that hopefully will advance our country's understanding of the systemic racism and racial injustices that are still so prevalent. The question before us is, how will the College of Fellows and the AIA membership participate in advancing our profession and hopefully society's understanding that indeed Black Lives Matter. How and where have the threads of systemic racism been sewn into the fabric of the architecture profession, its institutions and associations, and within the architecture, engineering, and construction industry as a whole? What issues of racial injustice exist at various steps of the professional journey? More directly, how can today's fellows of the AIA come together with tomorrow's leaders, that is the emerging architects, and do as John Lewis asked of us when he said, if you see something that's not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. That's where I was going to end my opening comments, but on this past Monday morning, two days shy of his 79th birthday, which is today, John Thompson Jr., the Hall of Fame Georgetown University basketball coach, died. In 1984, 36 years ago, when his team won the national champ championship, he told the Washington Post, and I quote, I am perceived as a success by standards created by white people. My team wins a lot of games. I make a lot of money. When I'm 80 and look back, and we know that's not going to happen, is that going to make me think of myself as a success? I don't think so. 
But if I change some things, even slightly, if I stand up on this platform I've been given and say, no, this is wrong, then maybe I will feel good about myself. I may not change anything. I know I'm going to upset some people, but I can live with that, end of quote. That, my friends and colleagues, is our challenge as we go forward. The agenda for today's session is intended to serve as an opportunity to listen, learn, ask questions, reflect on what you're hearing, and think about possible next steps. What can we explore in the chat rooms in session two that can lead to solutions as we go forward? We'll start today's program with some brief in information about AIADC's Barbara G. Laurie Scholarship Program and the related Fellows Endowment Fund. The rest of today's program will include brief presentations from our panel members and a follow-up discussion with added questions from you, the participants. Please submit your questions or suggestions at any time during today's program by using the question tab. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ralph Cunningham, FAIA of the firm Cunningham Quill Architects, to share some information and thoughts about Barbara G. Laurie, the woman that she was, the scholarship program in her honor, and the DC Fellows Endowment Fund supporting that program. Ralph. Thank you, Joel. It's, it's very appropriate that we speak about Barbara Laurie tonight. Uh, whose entire career was about paying it forward. She was a uh, prolific practitioner of architecture, and you can see on the screen here that she had over 200 projects. Um, she also practiced architecture for 21 years and was past president of AIDC, president of the Washington Architectural Foundation, board member of DC Preservation League, and trustee of Howard University Math and Science Middle School. One of Barbara's missions was to improve the issues concerning minority architects, especially women in the architecture profession. Barbara assembled interviews with many African-American women architects, and this will be included in an upcoming exhibit at the DAC. Our committee uh, uh, supports the Barbara G. Laurie Architectural Scholarship of the Washington Architectural Foundation. Next slide. So uh, here is a picture of our own Mary Fitch with the current uh, Barbara G. Laurie Scholars. Um, it is, the, the purpose of this scholarship is to promote uh, an interest in architecture and then to support architecture students as they make their way through their programs and also to support them afterwards as they take the architect registration exam. So this is a, a fully 360 degree degree of support uh, for students in this program. Um, many of you may be aware of the things that the chapter does to uh, support emerging architects, but just a few are listed here. AIADC Mentoring and Outreach, Design Like a Girl, Architecture Summer Camp, Partnerships with the DC Public Schools, scholarships, mentoring programs, architecture in the schools, Archibuilder Studio, and tools of the trade. One of the things we're gonna be talking about this evening is how to expand the pipeline of deserving people into the field of architecture. And these are the things that we are doing right now to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ralph. Um, as you can see, this is a robust program. Uh, and we'd like all like to uh, see it become even more robust in both uh, its participation and, and uh, financially. <clears throat> At this point in time, I want to start the panel. Um, and, <clears throat> and I want to thank the panel members for taking their time to be with us today. Rather than read the full resumes of the panel, I've asked that each member take the first couple of minutes of their introductory comments to provide some insights into their personal journey that has brought them to this moment. First, we have Howard Mack. Howard is a professor at Morgan State University and a design technology specialist and consultant. He is a board member of the National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA. 
Second, we have Joseph McKinley. Jo Joseph is a registered architect, a member of the AIA DC Emerging Architects Committee, and a lecturer at the University of Maryland School of Architecture. He's an architectural designer at Bonstra Hair Sign and Arch <coughs> Hair Sign Architects, excuse me. Well, that, uh, Joseph will be followed by Ian. Ian Walker is a member is a member of the AIA DC Emerging Architects Committee and an architectural as associate uh, uh, at the uh, Studio 3877, I'm sorry. Ian holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture, a Master of Architecture, and an MS in Sustainable Design, all from the Catholic University of America. Uh, Jennifer Matthews is next as a member of the AIA DC Equity Committee. She's an architectural designer with Sherlock Smith and Adams. In 2013, Jennifer was elected the National Vice President of the American Institute of Architects Students. She's the first African-American female to serve in this capacity. Jennifer will be followed by Catherine Prigmore, a fellow of, <coughs> of the AIA, and, and is an associate director at Shalom Baranis Associates. She has a robust resume and one of the things that I noted is that Catherine was one of the first 20 African-American women registered to practice architecture in the United States. Think of that, the first of 20, and that wasn't that long ago. Ronnie McGee, fellow of the AIA, is the principal of R. McGee and Associates, which he founded approximately 30 years ago. Ronnie has a Bachelor of Architecture from Howard University. Okay, so first off, let's start with Howard. Uh, Professor Mack, can you get us started by helping us understand the context for today's discussion? How would you define systemic racism and the racial injustice as it exists in our society? How and where does it exist within the architecture profession, its institutions and associations, and or within the architecture, engineering, construction industry as a whole? And how important is it for leaders in the industry to recognize their role and to engage in the effort to bring about change? Howard? Yes, hey, how's everyone doing? Thank you, Joel, for that question. And I'll do my best to answer it as I give this presentation. So in defining and looking at how um, systemic racism can be characterized, I put together this presentation. Can everyone see, see my screen here? It should be a black screen. If it's black, all black, and that's perfect. <laughs> All right. So, so basically, the, what we look at with, with systemic racism, a lot of times we'll think about racism alone, and then racism as one deliberate act that we can actually, uh, can you guys see my presentation? No. Okay. So when we look at systemic racism, we look at racism Wait. as a lot of times alone as one act, very overt and very obvious. But that's not actually how racism or, originates. Um, there's a system behind it that actually dictates to um, the racist acts that we see. And a lot of times we don't see that. It's behind the scenes. It is there by default. Um, it is something that we didn't create, but it is there and it does control the racism that we see. And then what happens is we see a continued level of acts that are sometimes not seen. It may be there for a moment, but it's hard to fully notice and put together where it came from. Um, and so that's how systemic racism kind of um, impacts us. But a lot of times we would think, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I love black people. I have black friends. I'm not racist, but there's an importance in delineating the difference between what is prejudice and what is racist. Um, to not be prejudiced is one thing, but to be racist is to leverage the power of that prejudice against a certain group of people. And if that power is leveraged um, by someone else, but you're contributing to it, then that also puts you in a category of systemic racism. So let's look at the facts that go beyond. First and foremost, we can all admit we did not create systemic racism. It existed long before we were born. It is embedded in the fabric of the country as a country was established with slaves. So while we did not create it, we do then have the, uh, we do contribute to systemic racism and we do also sustain systemic racism. So therefore it is on us to change ourselves if we want to actually change the systemic racism or change the system. And it reminds me of a meme that I love to show because it just, um, answers the question, uh, you know, gets the point across very clear. The question is asked, who wants to change? Everyone puts their hands in the air. Everyone wants to wants change. But then when it's asked, who wants to change? All the hands go down. 
right? So this is what we look at when we look at systemic racism. How do we function within, um, you know, this, this realm? And how do we actually make real change? So if we want to actually change the system, we need to change ourselves. There was a quote that I saw that I thought would be very important to this discussion. But there is no neutrality in the, in the racism struggle. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is not an in-between safe space of not racist. The claim of not racist neutra neutrality is a mask for racism. And that's given by Ibram uh, Kendi. And, and the best way to explain this, I have an analogy. You know, I love football. I played football my whole life. Imagine I'm playing on a football team and I've been winning the game. We're up by three touchdowns. And I realized in the third quarter the whole time that the referees were actually cheating for my team and against the other team. Okay, now I didn't cause the cheating. The referees decided to do that on their own. I didn't cause it. But now I'm aware of the situation. What then do I do? If I do nothing, that allows the problem to continue. It is on me. If I want change, I have to change myself. I have to no longer be complicit in that process. Now, the question then becomes, if I don't change, what does that then make me? Does that make me a cheater? If I know cheating is happening, I didn't cause it, but I don't change, does that then make me a cheater? Does that make someone who knows that the system is racist and doesn't change, does that make them a racist? That's the question, right? And again, we're not focused on racism as um, I think a lot of times there, are, there is a stigma around the term racism. Racism is the leverage of power. The prejudice is the thing that, that, that starts the discrimination is the thing that begins, the leverage of power that creates the racism after that is the thing that I'm focusing on right now. So then another quote. As an informed person who functions in a system that is inherently racist and culturally biased, the only way to not be racist is to be anti-racist. And that's basically a quote given by history as we've seen. Okay, continuing on. So this is a diagram about becoming anti-racist. And I'm gonna just highlight a few points. We have three primary zones. The fear zone is I avoid the hard questions. I want to be comfortable. I don't want to do anything that makes me uncomfortable. And I deny that racism is a problem. That's the fear zone. The next level is I recognize that racism is present. I acknowledge it. I seek out questions that make me uncomfortable. I do want to understand and grow and I, and I look to educate myself. That's the learning zone. Then the final zone is the, is the growth zone. I sit, with my, I sit with my discomfort. I speak out. When I see racism in action, I educate my peers on how racism harms our profession. I don't let mistakes deter me from being a better person. These are the things, this is the zone that we wanna to get to, the growth zone. So systemic racism continues to have a profound impact on the industry of architecture through both the profession and design practice. And that's a quote that's gonna be given today by today's panel. Um, we're looking at how systemic racism impacts architecture but not just the profession. The profession is one thing, the firm, the functioning of the firm, then also the type of projects we work on. The way we design, the way we impact the built environment, that's also an important aspect of it as well. And then another quote, we must address both of these with the implementation of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So it's been talked about and we look at um, these four terms and these are very important terms. And so what came from it is the term Jedi, you may have heard you know, um, uh, Jedi members uh, who focus on these terms within an office setting. So the question then becomes, what does it mean to be a Jedi? And it's important to note that um, we call it Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but it actually should be switched around a bit because there's, there are steps to it. You can't get to justice without first going through each step. It starts with diversity. Diversity is having all the people present and represented, that's diversity. Then inclusion is giving those people a voice, giving those people a say in what happens. Equity is giving those people an equal voice, an equal chance to make an impact on what happens. And then justice is the actual impact that, it, that serves to be fair for all people involved. So I wanna look at um, equity, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in both the profession and in design practice individually. So when we look at it in the profession, diversity, representation, like I said, for all people at all levels of the profession. The next inclusion, inclusion, seats at the table for all relevant and impactful conversations and processes. Equity, fair and quality influence on the decisions and practices and opportunities. And then justice, actions and solutions that are implemented and positively counter systemic racism. Then we're looking at design practice. 
We have diversity as well, awareness of the impact of parties in the, on a design project, thinking, planning, and designing for all groups of people, inclusion, hearing, including, and also, and it's very important to say, soliciting the voices and experiences of others throughout the design process. Equity is recognizing the direct and indirect quality of space for underrepresented groups and learning the fair and unfair impact of our design decisions. And then finally, again, justice, holding yourself, consultants, and clients accountable to be anti-racist in design practice, being aware of the community that you serve, being aware of the contextual impacts for all those on the, um, who are subject to your design projects, and working to benefit the macro organism um, through the broader needs and not just the incentivized ones, not just the clients who pay money, not just the people who serve to benefit off of it. So when we look at this, I just have one more quote, and this is the last one, and this is one we all know. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. And I, and I put this quote back in because justice stands there very clear. This is something that we've all said, that we've said many of times growing up, that we still say to this day. And then once you have justice, um, then you have liberty. That's the final goal is the liberty aspect of it. Um, and that is the goal of what we want. That is, the, that is what since systemic racism stands in the way of. And that's what we want to change. And I just want to uh, highlight this one project. Um, and I, and, uh, and it's, it, it's a cool project. I was looking it up a, a few weeks ago. Um, and it's just liberty and justice for all. And it's just a, a good indicator of where we want to go. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Um, and I hope you have quality questions for us to get into this discussion further. Thank you, Howard. That was very, very informative, very useful, and right on target with, uh, with what I think our goals are related to today's uh, portion of our two-part program. Uh, given that our goal for today's discussion is to leave with food for thought and perhaps some early ideas on actions that we can discuss during session two, uh, I'm suggesting a construct that may be useful. Um, if we think of the career path of the profession of architecture to consist of six components, and these are just uh, out of my head with the help of others who have contributed, perhaps we can begin to direct our ideas and initiatives into these categories. First, there's the obvious awareness of architecture as a profession. Uh, if you never heard of an architect or you never saw that this, this profession existed, you're not going to uh, be looking to do it. So awareness is critical and it, it can occur at the earliest stages of uh, ages in, in life. Education then follows. We all know that education, especially public education, is, is the great equator in, uh, in a, a democracy. Uh, education and the architecture profession has to be sought after. It has to be something you're interested in. Um, then we move into a career, career entry. You've gotten your degree, you're ready to roll out and get a job. Then licensing so that you can legally practice this profession <clears throat> and, and meet all of the requirements of the, of the profession to, your, to the uh, uh, community as a whole. There are career roles and responsibilities. The profession of architecture allows for very, very diverse roles and careers. And when you look at some of the things that fellows have done, uh, they, they fit in a wide uh, category of, of uh, activities and functions, all related to architecture and the building design and construction world. And then finally, leadership opportunities. We, we all are leaders uh, at some point as we grow in our, in our lives. Right now, we have leadership occurring from very young in the, in, in the discussions we're having, but leadership can occur, exist at almost any level. Um, but if you're a leader of a firm, that's a very specific role and a lot of responsibilities and a lot of opportunities. A couple of overarching questions that I hope the panel members can weave into today's discussion are, what issues of racial injustice exist at each step of the professional journey? Where can the synergy between the AIA fellows and emerging architects be most effective? And another thought is, what are, what are your thoughts on how the best way <clears throat> for all of us to seize the moment and affect change. So with some of that in mind, let's, let's hear from our individual panel members. Joseph, please tell us a bit about yourself and thoughts you have about the issues of awareness, 
education, the early points of engagement in the profession? Joseph? Uh, sure, and thanks for having me. I'm uh, really excited to participate uh, on this panel discussion with you all. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in Kingston, Jamaica. I did my undergraduate degree there, and then I did my uh, master's degree uh, here in the US at uh, UMD. Uh, I'm on the Emerging Architects Committee as uh, the outreach advisor for this year. And, and I also teach uh, design studio uh, at University of Maryland. Um, so as I mentioned, I grew up in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, and or downtown there is, uh, it, it, the, visually it's a little bit, it was a little bit depressed and I always wanted to fix it growing up. I always wanted to live somewhere that I thought was beautiful, um, but I didn't quite put two and two together that that's what architects could do uh, until I saw uh, my own home be transformed by an architect uh, when my parents uh, decided to renovate it. Um, then you know I made that connection that hey architects can shape their built environment. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, so I set out to do that. Went to undergrad at UMD and then uh, uh, in Jamaica, and then I came here to the U.S. Uh, to do my masters. When I got here, I realized that uh, two percent of architects here uh, in the U.S. are black. You know that, that's a number that a percentage that I've heard several times over. Um, and when I heard it, it was extremely discouraging, uh, you know, especially as a, a foreign um, student at the time, uh, you know, I thought my biggest hurdle to, you know, breaking into the architecture scene would be that I, I wasn't from here, but then, you know, that 2% of architects number being black just made it seem like such an exclusive um, um, career to get into. So it's, it's that, that number, it's, it's kind of daunting. Um, and then I realized, you know, as I, you know, progressed that architecture just isn't on the radar uh, for enough young black people. Um, I've worked, I worked with a nonprofit last year and they're a career focused nonprofit uh, dealing with um, young black girls looking to get into college and, you know, charting careers for themselves. And uh, I realized in with conversations with them, that, you know, they're thinking of law and they're thinking of, of um, you know, the, traditional careers that you hear, you hear high school and middle school children talking about, and not one of them really talked about architecture. Uh, none of them really thought it was a profession. They, never just, they just didn't think about a profession. Uh, and I've, I've found that uh, more and more, you know, that young black people just aren't necessarily aware of the profession. And it's something that I think the AIA, uh, we, can, we can work on, you know, because we realize that, uh, representation is important. You know, if black people um, are being designed for, then you probably, there probably should be representation for them on the design team, but also just generally in the profession, you know, if you have a lot of, let's say there are a lot of young black people in, um, you know, starting out in the career, uh, who are their leaders that they can look up to who have maybe been through similar uh, experiences as them. So, you know, if, if there are not that many black people in the profession. Those of us who are in the profession just don't have many, uh, you know, role models with similar backgrounds to look up to, and 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 that can be that can be excluding sometimes. So you know, the challenge for the AIA and just our profession in general is to increase that that two percent number to even be a little bit more reflective of the general population. Because um, again, we know that you know. We've learned that representation matters um, from the past events this year. Um, you know, if kind of one final point that I would probably make, uh, and, and I'm not really here to offer a thesis, it's just to offer this, um, you know, a few points uh, and then to participate in the questions and panel discussion later. But the, you know, a final point is that diversity and equity has to be intentional uh, because our existing systems uh, they've kind of failed to naturally produce uh, a diversity that's reflective of, of our general population. You know, again, that 2% number is, it's really, it, it's, such a, it's such a small percentage of, of, of Black people in a profession that, um, you know, we have to be intentional about increasing that number because it naturally isn't um, the outcome for, uh, that the systems have in place for us. So 
I just wanted to leave you know that point. Uh, I think Jennifer, you're you're next. Yes. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I uh, <clears throat> in setting up the batting order, I'm not going to change it because I announced that Ian would be second. But in fact, uh, Jennifer, I'd like to have your, you tell us your story and experiences, which are important for all of us to hear, uh, and your journey that's led you to your present uh, professional activities and today's topic. So Jennifer, if you could share with us. Sure. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, so thank you, Joel. Um, my name is Jennifer Matthews. I'm an architectural designer at Sherlock Smith and Adams, um, which is based in Montgomery, Alabama, which is my hometown. Um, I'm a full-time remote employee, but I'm still local to the DC area. I'm also an AIA um, DC Will Committee member. And um, a little about my background is I graduated from Tuskegee University in 2013. Um, I didn't grow up necessarily knowing an architect. I didn't know an architect growing up, but I did have a grandfather who was self-taught self and considered a master builder and involved in construction. Um, my uncles followed suit there. Um, so I grew up kind of seeing him add on to his home and build onto his home, and my grandmother still lives in that home now. Um, but I was, I had a creative kind of outlet growing up with an artistic side, but, um, I was getting ready to go to college and um, tour in Tuskegee University's campus because my dad is an alum there. Um, so as I'm, you know, walking down Tuskegee's Ave, um, he is strongly pointing me to the direction of the engineering building. And I quickly reroute him to the architecture building as we're passing it saying, you know, nope, I think this is where we need to stop <laughs> because engineering is not it. And I wanted to ma maintain that creative outlet um, so from there, um, you know, things kind of fell into place. It was the first time I walked in a building and um, saw black architects, um, talked to the professors at the time, both male and female, um, and really just kind of got a, a feel for what they did, what they created, the projects that they um, had the students do and just what it meant to be an architect or a black architect. Um, and I pursued that path going into Tuskegee's um, first year program. I entered you know, that program with 85 fellow colleagues. Uh, we started at the same time, but at the, you know, at the same rate as many other colleges, you know, students you know, decided to pick other professions. They, um, for one reason or another, and I was just kind of fortunate to start and um, finish and be able to juggle the academics and the athletics um, as a university softball player. But um, there were two main things that really defined my college career at an HBCU, um, kind of maybe actually three. So, I mean, I consider my HBCU Tuskegee University experience as empowering um, as sort of this like leadership awakening, self-awareness, love, and kind of this determination um, that was established by, you know, the people who look like you around you, the support that you have. Um, I had an amazing advisor um, who at our third, fourth year told us to, you know, hold hands and look at each other. And instead of saying, you know, the person standing next to you probably isn't going to be here by graduation, the message was flipped. And it was, you know, the people standing next to you, you know, you're accountable for and you you want to see them next to you at graduation. So we we stuck together and, you know, we supported each other. We, you know, persevered through that. And, you know, starting with 85 students, we graduated with only 13. And um, we had that number roughly, you know, around our um, going into our fourth year. So, you know, having an advisor who gives you that message of like determination, um, as well as just that overall mentorship, um, so aside from the advisor, I had an, a mentor that I established while I was a third year student at Tuskegee, and she was a black female architect who I'm now proud to say that um, she's currently my boss. So it kind of went full circle, full round. But um, having that advisor and that mentor were huge game changers to me to see somebody that looked like me as I'm going through this program, um, you know, that's very, you know, supportive and uplifting. 
But having those two people, you know, tell me about opportunities, tell me about programs, tell me about the events that are going on outside of the gates of Tuskegee University's campus that gave me that exposure to know that there was more, to know that there were things that we all could accomplish was completely changing for me. It was just a kind of a, again, like a, a self-awareness and kind of awakening moment in my college career. So I went on to running for um, the national vice president of the American Institute of Architecture students. And again, that was from the advisor at Tuskegee who said, well, there's, um, there's these student organizations. It's, you know, AIS, but there's also NOMA. Um, and they have so many different programs that are out there that are being offered and, um, you know, it is there for the taking. You know, you got to get out there. You got to go to these conferences. So I did go to AIS conferences. I did go to some NOMA conferences and, you know, just took advantage of those opportunities and what others had to say and those professionals had to say. So I, um, I ultimately ended up leading the AIS chapter at Tuskegee and revitalizing that helping out the NOMAS chapter as well. And we kind of almost co-led um, organizations at Tuskegee, but I ran for the position I won and I served as 2013, 2014 national vice president of AIS. And I was the first African-American female to do so at that national capacity, which is kind of interestingly kind of crazy at the same time that, you know, students are considered pro progressive, but um, we still, you know, accomplish things in different strides and, you know, my mention at that time of, you know, diversity and inclusion and HBCU involvement, you know, it was still a far-fetched thing for still those students at that time that didn't understand, you know, what that meant to be a student coming from HBCU. Um, so I had to talk about that and, you know, raise some kind of awareness of, of those students' involvement and their presence. Um, but ultimately, um, I developed an interest in career development serving as the AIS vice president and, you know, what those opportunities um, gave students as far as the programming, the event management, the event creation. And I was able to kind of go on to um, assist in the DC NOMA chapter with the NOMA symposium some years ago that brought students in to hear a series of panelists. And actually, Catherine Prigmore was one of those panelists and um, speakers at the time. Um, I also created the Mind the Gap program at Array Architects that introduced students to healthcare design. And then I jump started a professional development group actually at the beginning of 2020 that was kind of derailed a little bit by um, COVID um, that, you know, really digs into the career path that students can go into and just exposes them of those opportunities. And that was a result of my master's degree at SCAD um, for business design and arts leadership. Um, so to me, programming and events is everything. It creates the awareness and therefore the opportunities that students and emerging professionals have. And that's kind of the passion and the route that I take with my career. So, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we look forward to hearing more, <clears throat> more input from, from you uh, when, as the panel moves forward. Ian, uh, please uh, share your journey and uh, yes. <laughs> what you're engaged in today and your perspective. Yes, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm, Truly blessed to be here and talk to you guys. I'm so grateful that the fellows reached out to the Emerging Architects Committee um, to, to start this conversation. One that probably should have been held a long time ago, but we're here and I hope we can continue to carry out these conversations. Uh, again, my name is Ian Walker. Uh, tell you a little bit about myself, but I just want to again show appreciation for Jennifer. Um, I told you this before, but hearing all that about you again is really inspiring and um, I've personally seen some of your programs and events that you put on and, and I'm grateful for them. And uh, again, super inspiring to me. So thank you for sharing all that. Uh, my story is a bit of a dark contrast to yours. Uh, I did not know, I did not know any uh, colored architects, uh, design professionals prior to going to college. I'm originally from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my father's black and my mother's white. I say that because uh, a lot of the first questions people ask me, like, what are you? And not, who are you? Um, they, they look at my hair and they're confused. They look at my skin. They're not sure. But uh, I, I just shrug my shoulders. I'm just black and white. And uh, it's really um, not that simple, but it's that simple. And we keep it moving, right? But that being said, uh, I grew up to my black father who, you know, went to a four-year university. And he had started actually as an architecture major. And he dropped out because he, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, 
that was definitely not a profession for black men uh, to, to get into, and it would not be a promising one. Um, so he, he quickly got opted out of that. And he actually didn't tell me that story until I finished college, which is just kind of an interesting little caveat to that. But anyways, um, my desire to become an architect stemmed from two things, really, and experiencing through architecture. And in Phoenix, Arizona, that's not too many iconic buildings. It's really my sports stadium. So drawing my love for sports and uh, architecture culminated into walking into Arizona Diamondbacks Stadium with the opening roof and these opening windows and whatnot, uh, just kind of starting there. And then also uh, having friends who parents were either architects or interior designers. And so when I would go over to their house, uh, their houses would be custom designed, as you could imagine, in the hills of, of Phoenix, Arizona, on the mountains with infinity edge pools and this and that. I should probably say that I've gone to Catholic schools my entire life since kindergarten, and not just Catholic, also predominantly white institutions. And so that being said, I had a lot of white friends growing up, very few black friends. Um, and that was simply because of who I was surrounded with. And that kind of carried on, you know, into my profession, if you will, and it has nothing to do with what industry it is. It happens to has to do with who's around you, who you surround yourself with. And so coming to DC, out of an appreciation for the architecture, but also the culture and the diversity here, uh, I knew that would kind of be a, a good stepping stone away from Phoenix, Arizona. The other uh, thing about me was a desire to build a better future for myself and for my family. Even as a kid, uh, I designed floor plans of my house and my parents were separated. So I would design this crazy lot. And so my mom's house is over here. My dad's house is here. My house is here. And even having that crazy kind of massing planning as a child and understanding, I want my connections to be close, but I don't want them too close. We can't all be under the same roof. It just didn't work like that. So knowing those kind of little things as a child and translating that into a, a young architect now is still kind of interesting. Um, again, all that sort of desire for better for myself translated into college for a better future for my whole community, not just my individual family. And that being said, uh, sustainability became a big uh, element of who I was as a designer. Um, it's very foundational to me. And that being said, I was also one of the first students uh, from Catholic University. I was the first student to graduate with a minor in sustainability. And I'm super proud of that, not because it's the number one, but because I was sort of a guinea pig in a way of different syllabi and different courses to try to craft exactly what the best sustainability minor means at that time. And that was a few years ago and we've since graduated more, but that translated into a sustainable design masters for me and understanding how we build better for our communities. Um, so that's a little bit about college, but to answer the question sort of what issues of each step of racism, one is my awareness of architecture started only with white friends and their fancy homes and appreciation for that and wanting that for myself. And then in education, it started with uh, my dean, you know, the first day opposite of what Jennifer just said, he told our whole class, look to your left, look to your right, only one of you will be there. And when I looked to my left and my right, it was, it was white kids. And, and, you know, that's fine to me because I was used to that growing up. But at some point, it started to eat away with me eat away at me that I needed someone who looked like me, who wanted the best for me as a black man in this profession. Uh, I joke around, but it's not as far from a joke that I say architecture is sort of a country club profession and that it's extremely exclusive and you, you have to have money or you have to, you have to have something or know someone to get in and to do well at it. You have to know clients in order to get the projects. You have to, you know, have a reputation. And some of that is family business, right? I have no problem with architects continuing family business. I actually want that for black architects. So if we can, you know, shift that towards um, younger black individuals and show them that they can be the future uncles and aunts and grand grandmothers and grandfathers that started the architecture firm. Now, that would be great. And so that's kind of what I'm striving for. I'm also involved in a number of different volunteer things, but that's me. I, I want to get others involved, more importantly, uh, in the community into teaching uh, young black uh, boys and girls. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. That's quite a quite a story, and, and uh, appreciate your sharing that with us. Um, look forward to what what else you can have for us to learn from you going forward, Catherine. Uh, I've known Catherine for a long time. Uh, as a black woman and a fellow of the AIA, your story covers significant achievements and ongoing activities. Uh, please give us a glimpse of the architecture, engineering, construction world as you've experienced it, and as you see it today. 
Thank you, Joel. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, conversation. It's something that has, is long needed and, and I'm glad that we are, we globally are able to be open and honest and speak about these things. Um, you know, not just as architects, but as just human beings, that's these conversations are just really needed um, everywhere. Uh, for me, uh, I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about my perspective of, of this, the, the racism um, question or issues, because in my career, actually as in my life throughout from when I was young, when I was in high school and so forth, the questions that came to my mind when I faced discrimination was, first of all, wasn't because was it because I was black? It was usually because I was young and I looked even younger than I am. Um, and then also, as I grew older uh, in college and working, um, is it because I'm a woman? Is there sexism? In, in what I'm hearing and, and what I'm confronting um, in addition to the racism. So there's the racism, the ageism and the sexism. And there's also this other thing that just dawned on me while we were getting ready today is I have a, a little bit of a, I have a, actually a big difficulty in remembering people's names. So in our profession, as you know, we all, you know, we, we talk, we, we, we're always spouting off um, who, so what, person or which architect designed this or who the client is and so forth. And I, and you can ask my students, I have a really difficult problem remembering names. So that was also, that's actually also even today continues to be something that um, I encounter um, as an architect as, as being an issue. Um, so I started my architecture career actually before I started architecture. I, my first job out of high school was working for the city of Alexandria. And um, in that environment, I actually met uh, my first African-American urban planner and my first African-American architect. And they um, were really, really supportive of me. So um, uh, when I went off to architecture school, obviously I, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which at the time was 10% um, female, like barely just got to 10% female. Um, and most of the people were from New York or New England, um, which was not uh, something I was uncomfortable with because my mother was from Massachusetts, but it was a very different environment than growing up in um, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, so my background, um, somewhat like Ian's, was Basically, um, I was a black person living in a white world, basically my whole life. Um, because Alexandria, the, the whole DC area was very different 50, 60 years ago than it is now. Um, I felt very comfortable in a lot of ways at, at RPI because as students, um, you let down a lot of barriers and there's a lot, you know, obviously of, of sharing and mingling and those sorts of things as students. So, I was really comfortable at RPI, I excelled at RPI. Um, at the time, there were the, the largest number of African-American students in the architecture program than um, they ever have had there and have ha actually have had since, which was not a lot. It was less than 20 out of about 300 students, but it was there were enough there that we had a really cohesive um, group of a cohort going through through architecture school and they're all, they're all still my friends, which is um, pretty unusual. Um, but but what, are the, what are the things that my, my early life um, in, uh, in high school and architecture school set me up for, which um, I, I did realize probably 20 years ago or so was that I was able to function well and excel in an architecture profession, in the profession, which is, at that time, predominantly male. Um, we had the saying back then that um, the profession is a, is a, a profession of middle-aged white men or men with gray temples um, who either were wealthy or they married wealth. So that's how success, they were successful. I was obviously none of those things, but because of my background, I was able to 
maneuver through this. You know, I, I was raised to be able to maneuver through this culture, through this society. And um, I ended up um, doing a lot of things to put me, me, this black person in the, in, in the room. Um, I was very active in AIA when I was younger. Then I got involved with NCAR, but I was very, very active with NCAR for probably 10 or 12 years. Then I moved back into the, the AIA world. Um, I've been very active in NOMA. Um, my, um, I, there used to be a little um, uh, thing I had to say when I came to NOMA because half the people I knew really well and other half of the people would say, well, who is she, where is she from? But um, my job as an African-American architect, what I saw it was, is to be in the place where all the other African-American architects weren't. And I did that for 20 some odd years um, with these other organizations and um, paving the way for younger people, younger architects to uh, move into um, some of the positions that I held and, and to excel. Um, so the other thing that, um, I did um, as a, 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 along the way, actually, um, Barbara Laurie and I were professors at Howard University together for a while. And she was, she was trying to get tenure. Um, and you know, it's, what's changed in the architecture academia is that you actually have to do research or have something like that in your portfolio um, in order to get tenure. So we devised this program called Writing the Vortex, African-American Women Architects in Practice, um, which is a, a way for, it's an active way for uh, groups of African-American women to um, present their stories and then to um, mentor people who have heard them or who have actually pre presented in this, um, in this arena. So, um, Vortex started in 2007 and it's still going actually, um, you know, it's, it's just um, something that has uh, elevated a lot of women who would not have had a seat at the table um, to present to national or, or, or state or local forums. Um, so that's one of the kind of the things that I was able to do because of um, the connections I had made and some of the things I learned out, actually outside of the profession. Um, the other thing that I, I, I really wanted to do is um, in this form is just tell a couple of stories. I think I probably only have time to tell one. I'll tell one story. One um, a few years ago, I was um, uh, worked for a lar very large firm that had a, a, at the time it was going through a process of acquiring other firms. And um, we had a, a tradition of basically bringing the senior people individuals um, from the new firm into the office where I worked um, for a meet and greet. So one of these um, sessions was coming up and uh, I happened to be walking through the lobby when some of the folks uh, came into the office and uh, they asked me, it's like, where, where can I get some coffee? Can you get me, can you get me some coffee? So I kind of looked at them, you know, in my head, I'm like, okay, here we go again. Um, and I said, oh yeah, the kitchen is down the hall. Um, you can help yourself to, to the coffee. Um, you know, it's right there. We have cups and everything for you. So a little later in the afternoon, we all got together um, in, the, in the conference room for our, our meet and greet. And um, so I'm sitting there at the table and I'm kind of looking around. And then when I introduced myself as vice president and studio leader, um, I was, you know, silently kind of laughing at the expressions on their faces as they realized that, you know, they had made a, a kind of a mistake when they asked me to go get the coffee when they arrived at the office. So um, the, what, I, what I wanted to get out of this or to um, remind people from, from this experience, which was not that long ago, that wasn't that long ago, is that it's really important to, when you look at someone, to put aside your preconceived notions of um, who and what that person is based on what they look like and based on your, your experience, um, your personal experiences. Um, because you just never know, you really, really, really never know who someone is when you, when you look at them. Um, 
So, uh, in, in, in just in wrapping up, um, Jennifer and Ian and Joseph talked about um, mentoring and having other people um, support them along the way. I would not be here if I hadn't had really good mentors. And I really encourage you, if, you, if you're more of a senior person, to start mentoring, be actively mentoring younger people. And if you're one of the younger people in the audience, to reach out to um, some of the um, folks that you um, you know, or you may see as you look through the chat um, list, or, or and, and, and find ways to make connections um, to support each other through this profession. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, we are <clears throat> we are at the point where I can say, last but not least, uh, and have Ronnie uh, share a few thoughts of, about his experiences. Ronnie is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and the founder about 30 years ago of his firm. And so as somebody who's, who has gone uh, and put yourself in that position and survived, uh, and by that I don't mean just in, the ra in a racial way, I mean just survived <laughs> through all the ups and downs of the economy uh, that have occurred. Uh, can you share a few thoughts with us when we have about four, four or five minutes at most here to to get your, your thoughts on the table, and then we'll move right into the uh, discussion. Ronnie? All right, thanks, Joel, and thanks uh, for having me be part of this, and uh, thanks to all those stories folks we have here on the panel, very, very insightful uh, views of the world. I took a slightly different path, um, um, sort of similar to Jennifer, some of the ends and some of Kat, uh, Catherine. Uh, one thing about Catherine and I, I guess I can't remember names either. And I asked my wife to wear a name tag, but she won't do it. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so uh, I've I've uh, I've um, you know, been a principal of a firm for about 20 years. I was a partner in a firm that I started with another partner about 10 years. So the close about the 30. We started a firm not too long after school, doing small houses and things. But I graduated from Howard University. I took a circuitous path to getting there. I went to uh, Northwestern University for three years, majored in anthropology. Um, mm -hmm. And I uh, always wanted to be an architect, didn't know really what they did, what they wanted, what they, what they actually did every day. But I wanted to, I, I got, the most money I got was go farthest away in Chicago and the Northwest and was it. So that's where I went. So about three years into that, two years into that, I decided I really want to go back to architecture school. I applied to Howard, uh, applied to several schools, got into Howard as, as a, um, in the third year. And I came back and went to Howard and graduated from there in, in, um, in four years. So seven years total getting out of school. So. Um, so I uh, went from there and I worked for a public interest group uh, doing water quality research, kind of didn't want to necessarily test myself, didn't know where I fit in architecture. I never met an architect or been in an architect's office at that point. So I, I didn't know any architects, so it's different from most, most people. But uh, so I went to architect school, had never been in an architect's office, never talked to an architect other than my teacher. So the first interview I went on was the first time I had been in an architect's office. So I, I vowed when I, after I did that, that if I ever got a chance, I would, I would not have anybody I knew that was going to architecture had that happen. Got the job, uh, worked there for several years. Uh, but uh, from there, I, I focused on getting my license. I focused on learning everything. I, I never felt comfortable or smart enough or sharp enough to run a firm. I saw all these partners and all they knew. And like I said, I had no feeling that that would be something I could do, but I wrote down everything kept track of everything. I wanted to know everything as a lifelong learner. I, I watched people, how to handle consultants and, and clients and everything and work with each other and just wrote things down. I said, well, maybe at some point I'd have my own firm. So I just, I'm sort of naive enough and, and sort of a pessimistic optimist that that would happen. So I um, eventually uh, went to several other firms, uh, but I never felt that um, there was ever a place at the table for me at the leadership position. I always felt like, you know, they had a place somewhere along the, the, the middle of the road, but not a leadership path. And for me to run my own projects, get my own projects, and have control of my destiny. Uh, I mean, every time there was a, a recession, I might be the last one laid off, but I got laid off. So, you know, these sessions in the old days got very, very deep and very, very long. So it might be a 20-person firm going down to four, and I got cut at four, but still I got cut. So I said, I don't want that to happen. Only way I can get cut is have my own firm. So that's why that's one of the reasons I decided to do that. So um, 
But everywhere I went in a firm, I was only one or two black people in the firm. And my, my career has been kind of straddling that lifelong wise. I grew up in an all black neighborhood, except for two really tough Italian families. And uh, I went to um, a, a little uh, Catholic school in the Southeast, uh, which was 15% black when I started and 95% black when I finished in eighth grade. Uh, so Ian, I know, know where you were at least half the time while I was there. Um, went off to Gonzaga, all white school, total, uh, total uh, culture shock there. Um, I never had felt as much racism and, uh, and uh, animosity toward other cultures that I ever felt was at Gonzaga. And most of it was toward Italians and Polacks. And whatever. I heard more, more uh, words about people's ethnic cultures. I had never heard those in my household. Never heard that in my neighborhood. So I'm not sure uh, against Jewish people. I'm not, what, 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 how could you say something about Jewish people? What, do you know any Jewish people? I, I didn't understand that. So I went from Gonzaga and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, again, I'm in a, straddling both worlds. I go to Gonzaga during the day, come back to an all black neighborhood in the, in the afternoon. Uh, but you know, I, that, was, that, was, that was the culture in those days. Uh, I think the other older arch, black architects tell you the same thing. So I went from there to um, uh, Northwestern, graduated from Howard and I started my path in architecture. And I always thought that um, uh, after going, going to Howard, that I wanted to give back something to Howard. I wanted to give back something to the kids there. So I got a chance to teach at Howard, do some classes there. And uh, I started my career there. So I've been there about 20 years now teaching. And I sort of focused my career. And part of my reaching FAIA was my mentoring of students, mentoring of young architects. Every firm I was in, white, black, whatever, young architects, I tried to bring them along the path. I particularly focused on young ladies that were in the path. In Howard, I focused, uh, Barbara sort of got me involved in trying to make sure uh, women interns, architects, to stay in school, become architects. That's a very tough tough catch. A lot of them go into construction fields, other fields, not stay in architecture. But I, I, I sort of tried to make sure they at least got to look at the field to see if they can make that decision. Um, but I was naive enough in my career to believe that I could make it, um, make, make things happen. I, I, uh, I fought my way through um, the early stages of my first firm. The firm folded at one of the deep recessions. My partner and I decided to break up. But getting access to capital, getting access to the, uh, the, 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 the information network that gets you projects and, and uh, gets you a place to stake at the, a stake in the game. It's very, very tough. My second iteration of, of the firm was after I worked for the government for a couple of years, a chief of engineering at uh, Boeing Air Force Base. Um, and uh, I saw a little bit wider view of, of, the, of the, the metro area. So when I came back out, I said, I don't want to start my own firm. That's too tough. I'm going to work for a corporate firm. I worked for a firm for a year or so. But I decided, again, I wasn't going to get a place at the table. We decided, I decided this is not going to happen. So I went, had side projects, and I got a couple more side projects. And finally, I started hiring people. So I, just, I started my own firm again, So, uh, which is why I have gray hair now. So but what happens is, as an African-American architect running your own firm, I find that most of the folks that get to some position of leadership are a little older than their uh, compatriots, white or Asian. So I'm dealing with people 15, 10, 15, 20 years younger than me who are at the same position the firm is right now. I'm doing projects, you know, of a certain size. Um, and I'm, I'm dealing with people that are competing with me that are younger than me because they got there faster. They, got, they had access to things that I didn't have access to. I have access to them now. So what I'm trying to do is turn around and show young architects how to get there. Um, and this turns out to be a very unique opportunity in history and in FAI, um, I was elevated to FAA about two years ago, partially for my architecture, partially for my work in the community, partially for my work in mentoring students. Uh, if you look at my FAA applicant, it's very unique. It's, I've done different things to get there, not traditional. But my, um, my goal is to take advantage of this time period to make things happen. So, um, Joe, if you give me 30 seconds. Um, so, um, again, naive enough to believe in myself, but I want to make sure that uh, as we move forward in this process, that uh, there are key things that as architects we're doing and that the FAI leaders in the field are doing to make sure uh, we change our culture, we, we do uh, create social equity in, in the architecture field. So that's what I'm gonna be working toward. I mean, these are hard things to do, conducting pay audits in firms, assessing tenure, um, tying leadership to pay, creating a diverse referral program, uh, curating open discussions about race and equity in your firm, diversifying your team, 
you look out there, I got a project that I'm going to get a large building on. It's got a lot of uh, effort and a lot of uh, profile to it. It shouldn't just be all white ma young males, okay? So um, there may be people you put on the team that need work, but that's part of being that person to, to adjust that equity in your firm. So look at the whole business through a lens of diversity. That's what I want to be advocating and we'll talk about in a few minutes. So, Joe? Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. And I, and I appreciate your, your recognizing we are getting, running a little over on the time <clears throat> allotted for this portion. I do want to get the panel now to open up. Uh, it seems to me that when we, what we've heard a, 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 good, uh, a good amount about is, is the issues of awareness, education, and entry. Uh, uh, Ronnie, you just started talking a little bit further about what happens beyond that. Um, for, for all of those who spoke, is there anything more that you would want to add uh, to either your own thoughts or to what you heard from others uh, about awareness, uh, uh, eliminate how we can eliminate barriers for young black individuals in academia or in their subsequent entry into the profession. And I'll, I'll give you one example. For example, if large firms started to look, they, the, from what I've understand from others, uh, large firms tend, uh, or all firms tend to go back to their alma maters to look for, for candidates to come in the door. Um, there's no question that if, if, if it's true that everything I need to know I learned in, in uh, kindergarten, which is ex I had exposure to other people, I learned to engage with other people, and then I learned to connect with them. And those are the same three things we're talking about here, in my opinion. So it, that's kindergarten. That, that's what we need to do in a bigger way than I think we've done it as a society. And that's what I'm hearing you say. So let me stop talking. Um, what, what, are the kind, what are the kinds of things can we do in the recruitment? area of recruiting, for example, looking back at your alma mater, if it's not an HBCU, uh, but, but uh, another major institution and say, I'm not gonna come to your career fair unless you show me that you, you're doing more in the areas of diversity and inclusion in, in the student body. Putting pressure back into the system. Um, that's just a thought and I'm gonna stop. Uh, anybody have any, more thoughts about this kind of front end of the of the process. Well, I think that um, there's a couple of things that uh, you individuals can do or firms can do um, to support the the pipeline at the ac uh, college level. One of them is to, in addition to recruiting, is to support the HBCUs with um, significant grant money. Um, you know, at the level really to support an endowed fellowship or endowed, I'm sorry, an endowed professorship. Um, Cooper Carey, I believe, Alexandria firm just did that at, uh, is it Tuskegee or Southern? One of the, one mm -hmm. of the, Tuskegee. Tuskegee. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this firm, it's a, a white firm, it's a firm I've known my, you know, it's been around forever. Um, apparently, they actually have been hiring students from Tuskegee, and they decided to give a significant amount of money um, to the mm -hmm. institution. So that's one thing that can be done. Another, if you know, if that if that if some can't be raised, is to um, put together enough money for um, scholarships, just general scholarships on an annual basis, or to support the programming to bring in lectures, lecturers um, from diverse backgrounds. Um, we all know most architecture schools like to bring in star architects to speak to the student body, but all architects have something of significance to contribute to the learning of, of people in the academic arena. I'll also add uh, to that and say, you know, one of the best ways to, I believe, that's been tried and true to recruit Black people is with Black people um, to actually, when you have um, people at the firm, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, for me and, and my experience, I've been one of, if not the only black person at the firm I've been at. And in some instances, um, you know, I've not been empowered to recruit or to show other people my experiences there to actually show other people that, you know, I, I have a great experience here, therefore you can. But in instances where I was, I think that that showed to be very fruitful. 
Um, I think one one way of doing that is to actually sponsor, um, you know, people who look like the people you want to recruit to go to these schools and to show it just from my, from my own perspective. So I, I went to Harvard University for graduate school. I would have not have even applied had I not had someone who graduated from the school who told me to apply, who was also black, who also came through a very similar experience to me. If that, if that wasn't the case, I wouldn't even have thought of applying or going to the school there. So that's very important. There's a stigma that a lot of times, you know, uh, people, you know, black people are very unsure about certain circumstances. I don't know if I want to be in that realm. I'm not sure if I'll be as comfortable there, right? But when you see people who you know you interact with, who you see is like you, it's just like with anyone in a number of circumstances, it gives validation to you wanting to do it. And so I think one way that firms can do that is to invest not just in the programs, but in the people um, to actually um, support those programs. Uh, and I think that's, that's one thing that we could add to it. How, how important is it for leadership to empower people within their organization to address this issue, to come together? I'm not saying form a committee and a subcommittee and all of that. I'm saying really begin to have discussions and, and recognize that uh, without having the, the authority as well as the responsibility, you can't do anything. So if you have authority from the top to do something, uh, things can get done. How important is leadership, um, whether it's the leadership of a firm or an association or whatever we're talking about? Well, Joe, I, I think, think um, uh, who's that? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Um, excuse me for a second. I, I just, I think that as a firm owner, I probably think most of the people in the firms that are listening right now don't know if their firm leadership would appreciate them agitating for these kinds of activities. I think that the leadership uh, being involved in fostering that and opening that door would cause more action by those people under them. Jennifer, you want to add to that? I, I agree with that. I think, you know, from, the, you know, getting that, that respect and that trust from leadership to step outside of the boundaries of the typical. Um, you know, I've been at a firm before where, you know, the primary presence was, you know, University of Maryland and Catholic. Well, you know, because I was already in somewhat of a leadership position at the firm in terms of like program creation and helping out there, it's like, well, you know, well, what about Howard? What about Morgan State? What about, you know, there's so many other schools here in this area you know, why aren't we going to those programs as well? And if they don't have formal career fairs, you know, there's nothing stopping any architecture firm from going to either, you know, do a seminar, setting up a table <laughs> in the hallway and having the, you know, the professor say, you know, such and such architecture firm is going to be here on this day. If you'd like to set up a time to talk with them and hear from them, do that. I mean, I think there's so many different ways to be creative um, to get your either your firm out there or to get engaged with these local universities. Um, you can't always expect the student to come to you. Um, one example of that is that um, at a larger firm, um, there was a leader who asked me, he's like, well, I've never seen a resume come through my desk from Tuskegee. It's like, well, I mean, you know, these students, maybe first through third year, may not be even aware of your firm, but as well, you know, we're, it's Tuskegee, Alabama, you know, we do have to go out to the different cities to, you know, participate in different firms and get exposure there. And then you're also, you know, um, relying on the fact that these students have to go back to their home cities to even know about your firm and to know about you and to know the opportunities within your firm. Sometimes it's on the firm to get those opportunities out and to reach out to those individuals that you need um, to be representative of, you know, your employment. Um, at your firm, it's just not on the students and the universities to, you know, constantly reach out to you. Um, I'm looking at some of the uh, questions that have come in uh, from our participants, and uh, I, I'd like to uh, throw, uh, throw a couple of these out. Um, how am I addressing the challenge of systemic racism improve our collective ability to address climate warming? And, and I would add to that, what, what, in addition to climate warming, I think we can say 
the industry is changing. Our world is changing. And there are other avenues. When, I don't want to get into my life story, but I'm not a designer. And yet I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. My career path was very different for a variety of reasons. But the point is, you don't have to be a designer, but design is important, obviously. The, the, key point, uh, the key to this question is there are a number of different facets to what's going on in it. And are these opportunities, because they're different and unique and, and uh, not everybody is, is doing it, for us to further break down some of these barriers? I'll stop. Well, if I may real quick. Uh, oh, sorry, Ronnie. Um, one thing I wanted to know earlier in my talk, but I'll mention it now, is architects serve as the greatest clients to me sometimes. And I have not, I've only been able to serve as a client to myself in only a couple instances, one of which is a school bus into a tiny house. So it's a little different, but architects serve as greatest clients in their community because we know we know so many different facets of our built environment, right? And when you talk about design, it's such a small aspect in the actual uh, bringing to life of a building, right? And so architects, we know all little ins and outs of, of permitting, of codes, of future green building codes and whatnot. We know those ins and outs. And so when we serve as our own clients, and if I dare use the word developers of communities, um, I think that's where we can have some of the most uh, great change and we put sort of money back into our communities again as architects and mindful of, of the buildings that we're going to leave behind I think that's how we'll have some of the most greatest impact on things like global warming or just a better environment that doesn't harness this negative energy of police brutality and whatnot and so I know that doesn't specifically answer climate warming but I want uh, architects to start thinking of themselves more as clients frequently and, and push themselves as small firms, large firms to bring projects to life within their own office. Joseph, if, I'm, yeah, if I may jump in, um, you know, I think something that we've been realizing more and more lately is how uh, connected, uh, um, you know, I guess injustices are, and that goes to the idea of, of systematic racism. So, you know, it's quite often the people who, are um, you know often left behind in terms of, of you know economics are also people who whose whose built environments have failed them. So if you if you look at Hurricane Katrina, it's the people who, who have been the most kind of um, who have had the least opportunities who end up living in communities that are also um, unequally affected by climate change by sea level rise. So you know by addressing systematic racism and trying to understand all the systems that have left people behind in, 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 various, in, various, in various ways, uh, you start to understand um, that, you know, how you can also apply that idea to, you know, who's being unfairly um, disadvantaged by, based on where they live in terms of sea level rise. Well, or, you know, global well Joseph, the, the other thing I would add is that environmental racism is a real, a real product of mm -hmm. part of what's been going on the last hundred years. Where these deleterious projects are, where are plants, where are electric power plants, where, where, where roads cut through, where do things happen in a city is where a lot of times there's people of color or people of low power, whether they're poor or, or brown or whatever. So the idea is that if you're on a design team and you're on a board, you're on a commission uh, in the past, why would you think about those people? Those are others, those are the others. But, but, but now, if you, you have people of color or people of conscience on those teams, you're going like, wait a minute, everybody deserves the same uh, protection, not just people in this part of town or that part of town. So, so uh, bring it, you know, the, the rising sea doesn't float all boats, it seems. So um, I think that you have to make sure those boats are floating. So I think that, that what you're saying there, I mean, um, the, the true application of just sustainable design has to be looked at a little nuanced, like in some cases, you know, uh, some communities may have to say, well, we can't get them the, uh, uh, we can't make that building completely sustainable, but we're trying to get them houses, first of all. We can't be having, you know, we can't make it a lead house, but, but the point is you try to give them, you can do what you can to make the house sustainable, not deleterious to their health. So those are kind of things that, you know, you know, giving a thousand trailers to poor people that all have, you know, uh, smells and salts and all the organic, organic compounds in them, that was a major move by somebody 
which could have been cur curtailed. So that's the kind of thing that goes on in business that I think that architects and designers and engineers need to pay attention to when they're doing their work. So, Jennifer, well, yeah. I'm sorry, Jennifer, you, you want to say something? No? I, I was just agreeing. I would, Joel, <laughs> this is actually something. What did you just say, Jennifer? It was Catherine, I think. It's, it's Catherine. It's me. You it's Kathy. Um, this is actually one of my um, pet peeves. Uh, I taught sustainable design for environmental systems for 13 years. And I won't go into the long story about that. But anyway, one of the challenges I think every one of us needs to um, address, uh, uh, everyone that practices in this area, is um, how we use technology to solve the problems um, of sustainable design without really addressing them from the beginning. Um, you know, we have, now we can model uh, shadows and lighting and everything in Revit or, you know, in other software, but we don't, we don't start design at the beginning like you should. We're looking at the site, um, you know, getting beyond the issues that Ronnie brought up about environmental racism, but whatever site you're at, how does that site and what the program is relate to the environment? We don't design that way. We design, you know, to meet zoning. We design, you know, to get the maximum FAR. We design certain types of buildings because um, so they look a certain way. But we don't, and we need to address how these buildings are going to make our environment better. And that's starting with analyzing the environment and not waiting till the buildings basically designed and sticking it in some um, program into an energy analysis and then fixing it, um, which is, is not the optimum way to address um, climate change and global warming and all of those things. We're getting, we're getting close to, uh, to needing to wrap up, but I know Howard has, has something to add. I just wanna say that there are a number of other questions. Uh, we're gonna capture these questions and we will uh, mo do something with them as it relates to what we go forward with in session two. So if you didn't get your questions uh, addressed, uh, uh, take heart, we, we're not forgetting about you. H Howard, what did you want to say? Well, yeah, I think we can, just... the panel can potentially address some of those questions if you, if you send them out. So we could probably address those yeah, if you so want. We'll find, we will, we will absolutely do, do that in one way or another. I just, I can't commit exactly, but we're here, we're not going away. Howard? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just going to focus on the idea of sustainability. And a lot of times we look at sustainability and we look at the environment. And that's very important, but we ignore the, the actual sustainability factor as it relates to people and how they interact in that environment. Um, sustainability doesn't just, you know, um, you know, equate to adding technology or putting money and investing in what we do in the building but also how we design for practices of how a person uses a space now and in, the, and in the future. One example is affordable housing. Affordable housing is something that's done in a very unsustainable way. Affordable housing is done in a way where people can afford to live there, to, to buy a home, but then not really live in the environment that's around them at all. So they don't really stay for very long. So that's very unsustainable. And I think um, when we look at sustainability, that should apply, to, uh, that should be the word that architects use for everything. We want what we design to last and to last in a positive and impactful way. And that's not just from, you know, a greening aspect. It's not just a LEED certification. It is a sustainability of a quality environment and the people that function within that environment. So I, I think that's um, a lot of times forgotten. And I think we do need to uh, remember that as we, as we design. Um, we're at a point where I'm going <clears> to <throat> look to the panel members. We have about two or three minutes. If anybody has any final thoughts about this or <clears throat> going f as we go forward. Uh, the, I, would, I would like to say that we will hope there's another version of this that's coming. It, it, uh, Bill will tell you about the end, but that I expect and warrant and will push for leaders of firms to lead in this in this time. Okay? That's that's uh, that's my few words to say at the moment. Hopefully that is the case. So. Ian, do you have any final thoughts you want to share? I just want to show appreciation again and also send a message out to the, the participants uh, whom I can't see and tell them, please reach out to either myself. And obviously, I'm going to speak for everyone here. Uh, 
personally, if you have any other questions or you just want to talk about, i.e., this is kind of me asking for mentors, or if you know someone who needs a mentor and you think I might be a good fit, I'm currently looking for um, a younger individual who I could, ideally, I'm looking for like a high school student that I can, I would love if five years from now, I'm working next to someone who, you know, I just spoke to our architecture about in high school. So that's kind of where I'm at. And, uh, you know, hundredfold, if you guys could, you know, circle that back, I appreciate it. So thank you for your time and listening. I'd like to continue in this vein. Anybody else? We've got one or two more minutes and then we're going to have a hard stop. I'm going to say my last words, which are, don't forget to register for the, for the program, uh, in, uh, on the 16th. Uh, we're going to pick this up with chat rooms. We're going to try and put some ideas on the table in those chat rooms where you bring your ideas and we'll see where we can go with this. There are other organizations within the, uh, the construct of, of AIA and NOMA, et cetera, and others who are involved in divers diversity and inclusion. Uh, we are going to try to work together collaborative, collaboratively um, I just want to say that we, the fellows of the AIA, here in D.C. for sure, and when I see that what's going on nationally, it's national. Uh, we're all, we're in on this game. We, we, this is this is serious stuff. This is a, an opportunity that's unique. I've been here on this earth, thankfully, for 78 years, and uh, I've seen a lot. And this is the most opportunist time I've seen to do something. That's my last words. But anybody else, and it, we'll go until they shut us down. Thanks to the panel, wonderful panel, and people helped us get there. Joel, uh, Marco, Jim, others that helped us get to where we are. So and if, if the panel, if people are like this panel are going to be out there in the future, I have lots of hope for the future. Yeah, I would I would say one thing really quick in that, um, well, first off, thank you so much, uh, Joel, for, for organizing this to, to the fellows committee as well. Um, I think one, one, another thing that I wanted to make a point of as we discuss, um, I'm, I'm a member of DC NOMA and we're putting together a call to action task force. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of it, um, that everyone has the opportunity to join. Um, we are doing research. We are actually putting together a survey that we're going to send out to um, all the firms that we're going to uh, use uh, help from the AIA to also send out. And we're going to you know, do our research and then actually use that research and the information to leverage against real change, to actually you know, push the needle to say, hey, this is where things are and this is where things need to be. Um, so while, as we're organizing that, uh, we, we invite all of you to join the survey that I'm talking about. Uh, we already discussed I'm going to distribute at the next uh, panel discussion that we have. So um, we're hoping to get maximum responses on that as well. So thank you very much again for, for this. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And th thanks, everybody. I'm copying all these questions out right now. Be safe. Be safe out there. All right. Thanks. Okay. Stay out. Thanks. Bye. See you in two weeks. Bye.